Josh Lambert's an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati, and he'll be talking about exploring interactions and regression models with R and RFSA. Uh, Great, can you guys hear me? If I can hear you and I can see your PowerPoint, so go ahead and you know, do presentation mode. Okay, looks great. Perfect. Well, thanks for the introduction. So yeah, my name is Josh, and today I'm going to talk to you about exploring interactions in, in regression models using R and RFSA, a package that I built uh, a couple of years ago. So first thing I'm going to do is uh, ask you to introduce yourself to Tom, the data scientist. So Tom's typical tasks are to build uh, multiple linear and logistic regression models in R. He typically deals with tabular data that is quite large in size, and what I mean by that is it has many variables. Tom has recently realized, though, that his models lack complexity, meaning that they do not have interactions or quadratic terms in them often. They oftentimes just have many main effects, and he'd like to fix that. You might ask yourself, why would why does Tom want to add complexity? Well, without including quadratics or interaction terms to the model, Tom is assuming, assuming that there's just really linear relationships going on in his data set. He's also assuming that uh, there are equal effects across all the subgroups, such as sex, race, or age. And uh, for now, Tom would like to avoid machine learning, such as random forest, which does a good job at modeling these types of complexities because he likes the interpretability that these models give him, and also he's very familiar with them. And really what Tom wants to be able to do is to be able to investigate quadratic and interaction terms to add to his regression models. And currently, um, at least before RFSA, there really was no way of being able to do this in a quick and easy way. And so that's where RFSA comes in. Um, but before RFSA, Tom's problem was, at least with R, uh, regression models such as LM and GLM require handcrafted quadratic and interaction terms. So you'd have to actually go in and write those in for each model you'd want to consider. And you'd have to actually think about what are the interaction models that you wanted to look into because there are many uh, interaction terms when you have many variables. And that's that's Tom's second, second problem here is that he has many variables and that's going to require a lot of time to check all of those. So for instance, with 200 variables, which is really common in Tom's uh, workplace, uh, to look at all two-way interactions is to check 19,900 interaction models. And to look for all three-way interactions, uh, Tom's going to have to check 1.3 million. And on his Raspberry Pi machine, that's just not really feasible. So uh, uh, Tom really needs a solution here, and that's where RFSA is going to come in. So Tom thinks to himself, is there an algorithmic and data-driven way to explore interactions in quadratic terms and regression models without the need to handcraft them and to check all possible combinations? That's what Tom would like to be able to do. So uh, drum roll, please, the, the, the solution here is RFSA. And that's, um, I have a paper out about that in uh, early 2019, late 2018. Uh, that implements uh, an algorithm called the feasible solution algorithm. That's where the FSA comes from. FSA uh, was first invented by a man named Alan Miller back in the mid 1980s. And I've repurposed it here to work, uh, to primarily be used again in the identif identification of interactions and regression models where we have large data. So this package supports the optimization of many different types of criteria. So it will work with any type of criteria that you might be interested in, such as R squared, AIC, or even your own user-defined criteria. You can make your own and it will, it's plug and play. It'll also work with really any type of modeling strategy that you could think of. So you can use linear models, general linear models. I've used it for survey-weighted Poisson regression, um, mixed models, all kinds of different models. It's very, very flexible. And it gives multiple solutions. So when you run the algorithm, it will end up in a certain location at the end. Uh, it's going to end up in a place that's called a feasible solution. I can talk more about that later if you're interested. Uh, so usually what we do, um, because we're not guaranteed to get the optimal solution, a feasible solution though may be an optimal solution, but it doesn't have to be. Um, we usually run the algorithm many times to end up with many feasible solutions. Uh, and then investigate those for further. So Tom decides this sounds like a great option and he'd like to uh, do a little um, example to get up and running. So we're gonna use the MT cars data set here. Obviously this is not a big data set, right? 
Uh, there's only 11 columns in the data set, but this is a good place to start. And just so you know, up front, I've actually used FSA on data sets up to 300,000 columns. So uh, it will work really anywhere in between that. Um, and it's also uh, flexible uh, to work with if you're on the Linux environment or Mac environment to use all the extra cores that you have uh, on your machine. So it will scale up. So we use it many times with machines that have you know, 50 to 100 cores on them uh, with no problem and it utilizes those. So the empty cars data, you're probably familiar with it. I'm not going to really go into this very much, but here are some of the variables that are in that data set. So Tom is interested in modeling miles per gallon and, and what are the factors associated with miles per gallon. And Tom already knows that weight and how many cylinders the car has is associated with miles per gallon. But really what Tom's question is here is he wants to be able to identify uh, these variables XA and XB that interact with one another that he hasn't previously identified that are in this data, right, to add to the model that he already has. So he's, he wants to be able to adjust for weight and cylinder. He wants those in there fixed, and he wants to be able to add these two in there, but he doesn't know which two to add, and he needs some help getting there. So this is the code. Um, it, it looks pretty daunting, but most of it, as you know, uh, is commented uh, in the screen here. So it's actually pretty small. Uh, I just ran this not too long ago. This takes all, it it's, takes sub, you know, sub second uh, to run this code to look for interactions in this data set. Um, and actually I ran it for a data set that had um, 300 columns in it and it took about 50 seconds to run uh, to look for three-way interactions. So it's, it's very fast for all types of different models. So basically what you put in here is you put in, um, first off, what is uh, Tom's base model? So Tom's base model is this weight and cylinder model of uh, miles per gallon. You plug in your data, you tell it what is the function that you're going to use to fit the models to. That's LM. You can plug in whatever you'd like here. You can use GLM, anything else. As long as it takes a formula function, you can use that. Uh, fix var, uh, this is what we want to fix into all of the models that we're going to consider when checking for interactions. So in every model I'm going to check interactions for, I always want weight and cylinder to be in those models. I want to look for interactions of size two. I could plug in three, four, or five here if I wanted to look for five-way interactions. I wouldn't recommend that. You're gonna probably be in uh, interpretation hell, um, but you can do it with RFSA. It will work. It might take a long time, but it will work. Uh, let's see, this is the number of random starts that the algorithm is going to use. So it's gonna start in a random place and it's gonna end up at a feasible solution. And at the end, we're gonna investigate what are the feasible solutions it found. You just have to set interactions equal to true. You don't, uh, that can actually be false. If you put that to false, it's gonna look to not add an interaction to the model, but add two main effects to the model. Okay, so that's how that works. And then you plug in your criteria here, adjusted R squared, and what you wanna do with that. And I wanna, I, I want to optimize it, it so I wanna maximize that. So uh, it, it takes two different, uh, you can either maximize criteria or minimize them, so you can just put either min or max in here. This is what you run to show the results. And then to plot the results, which I really recommend when you're looking at interactions, really helps with the interpretability because the parameter estimates become super weird and funky and hard to interpret. Really helps to be able to plot them. There's this other package called SJplot that really is great for that. So I didn't feel like it was worth reinventing the wheel when SJplot already did a wonderful job. So this is what the output looks like. So when you run this, or when you just uh, print this out, the FSA fit, you get what was the original fit. So this is Tom's original model and what the criteria was. This is the adjusted R, R squared. Um, S, uh, the, feasible, the first feasible solution that it found. So remember we did 10, right? And uh, nine of those times it landed on an interaction between horsepower and weight. And then another one of the time it landed on an interaction between this drat and carb variable. And these are the criteria here. So we can see with this first feasible solution, this was the optimal one that it found. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the optimal one. In this case it is because this is such a small data set. Um, and typically FSA is gonna find the, the optimal answer, but it's not guaranteed. You have to do a sufficient number of random starts. We have a paper out about what that number is. So if you're interested in that, I can give it to you. But you can see that the criteria is, is uh, considerably better over the original, uh, Tom's original fit. So like I said, plotting these interactions is really helpful. That's where SJplot comes in. And you can see easily here that this is an interaction, right? This is textbook interaction. 
Uh, and you could get into the interpretation of this if you'd like. I'm not going to for this uh, slide, but uh, if you go back and set m equals to 3 and then do the plot, you're going to see uh, things that kind of look along these lines for interactions, which again kind of gives you even more insight um, and nuance into the types of interpretations you can find with your data. So next I want to take it one step further. So we talked about linear regression in kind of a small data set. This next, for the remaining amount of time, I'm going to kind of jump through how you would do this with something else that isn't so simple, such as linear models, but something more like linear mixed effect models. So out of the box, FSA does not work with linear mixed effects models, but you can write easy wrapper functions to make it work. So I actually had somebody uh, recently uh, get in contact with me from uh, one of the oceanic agencies, uh, and they do a lot of mixed effect modeling out there. And so they wanted to know if they could use RFSA to look for interactions in their mixed effect models. So I helped them with doing that using a little example here, which I'm going to show you. So one other thing you need, though, in order to be able to do this is the random component of the linear effects model has to be determined beforehand before you proceed on. That has to happen. If you don't know that, there's no way currently with FSA to do uh, model selection on both the random and the fixed part of the linear effects model. So you have to know that random component first. So this little example, it's the dragon intelligence example. I kind of stole this uh, from this website here. Um, but really what this person, this investigator wants to be able to do is uh, they're training dragons and they want to know uh, what are the things that go into dragon intelligence. And they uh, go out and collect specimens from dragons to measure the genetic expression of 100 commonly studied genes. And they also get a number of fixed factors and they're randomly kind of gathering these dragons from different mountainsides and they want to basically uh, include a random effect, do a mixed model where they have a random effect for mountain range. And so this was the code that you would write. It's really too short of time for me to get into this, but you can do it. You can write this little wrapper function that does it and you can print out the results. And so this is what the results will look like. And you can see it found a number of interactions that uh, had uh, you know, good criteria that you can investigate further here. So that's uh, the end of the examples. Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of disclaimers here quickly before we wrap up. So first off, this is an exploratory method. So we're doing lots of model checks. We're not doing nearly as many as we would do as if we did exhaustive search. So if we checked every possible combination, we would check a lot more. So in the actual R function, I do print out um, the, the, the function actually prints out how many checks you did versus how many you would have done with exhaustive search. So that's a nice kind of feedback, but you need to know you're doing an exploratory method here. I mean, these, it's, this is not better than you walking in the door with a interaction in place, wanting to check it and checking the p-value. Um, it's, it's, it's just not as good as that. Uh, but this is a great place to start if you're not sure if interactions exist and you want to be able to suggest them in the future on different data sets. Um, we found this to be tremendously useful at finding nuanced um, types of relationships in our data in subgroups of people, specifically in patients, um, where you know a drug doesn't appear like it's working. But when we look for the interactions, we identify that there are subgroups of patients that actually do get a big effect from a drug. Um, that's where a lot of my research focuses on currently. So we have another method uh, that we implement alongside of FSA called bootstrapping. And we also do a kind of a training and validation to check and see whether or not the, the interactions kind of validate through these bootstrapping and validation procedures. So we do do that. I can, if you're interested in doing that with FSA, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to share the code on how you would do that. But yeah, FSA is super flexible from different types of modeling strategies to I can incorporate bootstrapping if I want to I can incorporate training and validation. It just depends on how messy you want to get with the code. Um, FSA can probably do it. I've done a lot of different things with FSA. So in summary, um, exploring and identifying new and interesting interactions or quadratic terms for your regression models is easy and fast with RFSA. And we have used RFSA to explore interactions with data sets that have thousands of variables. And you can use it for lots of different criteria and fit functions. And that's the end of my talk. 
All right. Thanks, Josh. This looks really useful. Yeah. When you have so many variables and avoiding something like a random forest where you're not going to be able to interpret uh, the coefficient. So this looks really useful. And we do have some questions on Slido. So I'll ask you okay. those that we have uh, plenty of time for questions. We got the full five minutes. Uh, so Nino asks, what if there are heterogeneous interactions? What are there? What if there are heterogeneous interactions? I guess I would need some more clarity on what you mean by that. Um, so yeah, I don't think I can answer it's that. Like I could. I, let me see, uh, Nino. If, if you're willing to unmute yourself here, real quick, you've been asking lots of great questions. All right, Nino, I unmuted. Gave you the option to unmute if you want to ask your question live here, real quick. Um, Okay, he may have stepped away. So let's go to the next question. Um, does this package test orthogonal polynomials? I have no idea what that is. Okay, I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people it may, it may. I, I can't say no and I can't say yes, but okay. it may. <laughs> okay, um, great. Um, uh, and for those people who have asked questions, you can add, you can follow up and slide it with, with uh, more uh, explanation. Uh, we have plenty of time. Okay, so this question says, is there a way to use the RFSA package with the Bayesian model selection presented earlier? Yeah, I was thinking that exact same thing. So uh, I think that that would be a perfect collaboration, you know, in the future, Thomas. So uh, once your package is ready to go, uh, maybe we could look at a way of trying to marry the two in some way. I, I think that has been the biggest ding on FSA so far is how do I, you know, know which one of these models that you're getting that are feasible uh, are in fact the best model um, to use and which one should I prefer over another. And so, yeah, it'd be really great. Okay, great. I have a few questions, but while I ask those, feel, people feel free to add, add more to Slido. So one is, so, um, so your, your, the models that your um, program puts out are more interpretable than random force, but how do they, how well do they do as far as like, if you wanted to do predictive analytics, do you mm -hmm. touch when you compared to say doing a random force when you're trying to do uh, you know, predictive power? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So we've, we've done a lot of, we've done a lot of different projects that have involved predictive modeling in the past. I have specifically, and the, it depends on how many interactions you want to be able to add. So if you're willing to add three, four, five interactions to a regression model and deal with the interpretability of all that and the potential mess that it that may come along with that, then uh, yes, it can definitely outperform random force and give you a lot more interpretable things, it, depending on the setting, of course. Typically what we would do in that, in that place is we would do both and then really look to see if there's really a difference. And if there's not a difference, we'd probably prefer the regression model because it has, again, Kind of a superior um, interpretation. Although there's a lot of methods out there right now uh, for in interpreting machine learning models and so there's actually a lot of really great books out there about that. So I can't dismiss it but yeah there, I think that this is really a great tool for being able to add some complexity to your regression models and, and be able to probably get closer to um, a lot of the machine learning work that's out there. Great, great answer. Um, okay, we got to follow up on orthogonal polynomials. Orthogonal polynomials are made in R via the poly function, P-O-L-Y parentheses. So it, it may, I, again, I, I would have to look more into what that function does um, and, and see how it works. But off the top of my head, I would say it probably doesn't work out of the box, but you could probably do some hacking to get it to work. Okay, great. Um, so I, I forgot to disable the chat. So we have a question in the chat uh, It's disabled now, but so as so a asks, what advantages uh, does RFSA have over all possible regressions? Well, I think there's a lot of advantages. So first off, when you're fitting models such as linear mixed models uh, with large data sets, we all know that that can sometimes take a, some time to just fit one model. Um, so if you're wanting to investigate interactions in those types of models, checking all possible combinations is just not something you can do uh, or something you'd want to do. Unless you have access to a really big resource, maybe you could write that code. So I think one of the things is it saves you computationally. The second thing is, is it's a really great function 
uh, in terms of just being able to quickly kind of get in and get some answers out without having to write up a bunch of code for each example, each thing that you want to be able to do. So uh, we actually have a Shiny app that is even easier. You can upload your data to and you can build your regression model right in the Shiny app and look for interactions if you don't even know how to use R. So I've that's been really useful for some people in the past who don't want to get and use R. Um, so yeah, those, those would be some of the reasons why I would say uh, RFSA would be useful over doing complete enum enumeration. If you can do that, I would say, great, go for it. Although you're, you're gonna be checking a lot more models. So you might really worry about something like uh, multiple comparisons in that type of scenario versus like for instance, um, in, in what I had done earlier, where I looked at the, um, and you can't see this now because I stopped sharing my screen, but uh, with the 100 variables, and I checked all three-way interactions, or not all, way, all three, but I used FSA to look for three-way interactions. I only did 17,000 model fits versus what I would need to do, which was 1.3 million to get to feasible, to get to uh, about five or six feasible solutions. So it saves a lot of computation. It saves a lot of model checks. So, yeah. Okay, great, great answer. Um, okay. Thanks so much, everyone, for the questions. Thanks to speakers, Thomas, uh, Erica, and Josh. Thank you. So that's the end of our um, the modeling session. So we're going to take a 20-minute break here. We'll be back at uh, 2.25 uh, uh, p.m. for our final session of the day on uh, communication. So I uh, hope to see you there.